going back, if I had been someone that listened to instructions, be quiet, wait your turn, I wouldn't be the guy I am today. And I hit a really, really rough patch in my life to where I was at rock bottom. I actually lived in a halfway house. This is my first time sharing that. What made you choose a halfway house? I didn't trust myself to be alone. The hardest part is just getting started. To this day, the doctors don't know why I got cancer. They don't know why I had two different cancers. So now I think I was 31, fighting two cancers at the same time. In my mind, I'm dead. I was at a Washington Mutual ATM, staring at the machines down to like my last couple hundred bucks. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I gonna do for money? If, if, I, if, I, if I put my mind to something and I say I'm going to do something, I will do whatever it takes mm -hmm. to get it done. If I say I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to lose weight. If I'm going to build muscle, I'm going to build muscle. If I'm going to start a business, I'm going to like whatever it is I do. And it's awful. It's painful. There's highs. There's lows. It's emotional. It's difficult. It's stressful. But as long as you never quit, you never fail. And eventually you're going to win. Welcome to the show, Tark. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you here, man. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. You've, quite a lot's happened since I saw you last. Yeah, a lot. A little baby. Yeah. It's not so not not probably not so little now. Nine, ten months. Almost ten months old. Tristan J. L. Musa, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. That's now, three kids, by the way. Three kids. <clears throat> and you know what? You don't look tired. Um, well, you know, that, that'll be the Botox. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, hey, science works. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You got to, you got to sleep. Sleep's important. Sleep's important. So how is it with an, obviously with your two older kids, how is it having a little baby in the house? It's awesome. You know, I, like I, like I tell my wife at 42, I'm, I'm finally ready to be a dad and deal yes. with the baby. You know, I'm just kidding. Um, you know what, man? It's been an incredible experience. I didn't know what to expect going into it. You know, having two older kids. And starting over at 42 but like my kids are so excited um my relationship with him is different you know i'm not stressed out i'm not in my 20s i'm not thinking about work so i can be calm i can be present we play so so it's a really nice experience yeah that's cool i mean <clears throat> my kids are much older now and i'm 40 so it's it's definitely if i, if I had to do it again and I don't yeah. know that I'm like, I don't know that I have the in me to do it again. <laughs> but if I had to do it again, obviously, I think it would probably be a little different, like you're saying. Yeah. More mature. It's a, it's a different experience. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're, you're actually the dad that you, because I was, I don't know if you felt this when you were your first uh, go around, but I always felt like I was playing dad. Like I always had that imposter syndrome of being a dad. Like everyone else was like, you're not really a dad, are oh, you? Oh, hundred percent. Because I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure you're like me. We were so focused on becoming someone, uh, on being an entrepreneur, on building businesses, mm -hmm. or making money, or getting ahead in life, and you know, at the time, you're you're so focused on being an entrepreneur, you know, being a dad at the same time when you're building, it can be difficult. It's scary. Yeah, yeah. But the good thing is this. <clears throat> Here's what I learned. So when my kids were younger, I was working a lot, right? Um, but I learned that they don't remember. <laughs> so you know, like. I got fully, fully, fully involved with, with both of my kids' lives, like fully, around, you know, four years mm -hmm. old. But the first couple of years, you know, we were building businesses, filming shows. I mean, I was never home. I was always working. Uh, but now I'm best friends with my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I coach their sports. We, we, we play chess every day. We play video games. Like, we're buddies. So it, it all worked out. That's awesome. And you're right. They really don't remember. My, my youngest was infatuated with elephants to the point where my wife would take her to the zoo two or three <laughs> days a week and everything in her room was elephants. She's 12 now. About a year and a half ago, we're like, oh, remember you had that elephant? She goes, I had an elephant? <laughs> and I'm telling you for the first five years of her life, everything was elephants. Yep. And she has no memory of it whatsoever. And then yep. I was like, oh my gosh. That yep. first five years is developing them and for me. Yep, 100%, 100%. So, you're right. Yeah. You're right. So my question for you to start this off is, are you pushing entrepreneurship on your soon-to-be high school age uh, son, right? Uh, well, my daughter's 13. You're, my son is uh, eight. And then my youngest son is gonna, about to be 10 months okay. old. So your both daughter. My, yeah, both my older kids. My 13-year-old daughter, she's my twin. Like, she's going to be an incredible entrepreneur. Uh, same with my son. He's eight years old. And, and actually, my son is obsessed with real estate. So we, we go online. We look at houses for sale. We look at fixer-uppers. He's actually written a couple offers with me on property. So he is just so excited about real estate investing. 
Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. So you do want to see your children follow in the footsteps. A hundred percent. And I do so many different things. Like I tell my kids, like, what do you want to do? Do you want to be an influencer? You can do that. Do you want to be a TV personality? You can do that. You want to be an entrepreneur? You can do that. You want to be a real estate investor? You can do that. You want to be an educator? You can do that. Or so, an author? Or an author. Or like there's so many different things. And that's the beautiful thing about life. You know, so many people put themselves in a box of what they can and cannot accomplish. And I believe that they, they're... I believe they're like that based on everything they were they were taught their entire life. Mm -hmm. And what got me in trouble as a kid is what created success for me as an adult. Sit still, be quiet, wait your turn, pay attention. All the things I never did is what has created my success. Now, going back, if I had been someone that listened to instructions, be quiet, wait your turn, I wouldn't be the guy I am today because I wouldn't have been as confident. I would have been quieter. I wouldn't have raised my hand for things. So it's really interesting as, as people, you know, we can do so more, so much more than we believe. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's one of the big reasons why I press so hard every single day. And, you know, people ask me all the time, like why I do what I do is I want to show the world anything's possible. I literally grew up with immigrant family, a uh, rougher area in Buena Park, California. And I'm on this mission to show like anything is possible. But what gave you that, that confidence that to know that, what was that moment in your life where you were like, I don't care that everyone's telling me to sit down and be quiet and wait my turn. There's a path for me. And then you were able to break a glass ceiling that a lot of people never get to break. Yeah. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story. I was, I was five years old. Uh, my dad's from the Middle East, big soccer player. I was on the soccer team. And at the end of the season, they actually picked my dad to be the coach for the all-star team. And as a kid, man, I was so excited. I'm going to be on the all-star team. My dad's the coach, right? My dad didn't pick me. So I'm five years old. My dad gets picked to coach the all-star. All the little kids are screaming and yelling, and my dad's picking the team. He didn't pick me, and I'll never forget. We're at dinner that night, and I'm crying at the table, and I'm like, Dad, how did you not pick me? And he goes, well, you're not good enough. I was like, wow. <laughs> like he said, but. I come with the team, Dad. Yeah. But then he goes, but you can be. All you got to do is practice. So very early on, I learned that nothing's given to me. And if I want something, I have to practice. So then I learned I need to start practicing things. So as a kid, I'd practice things. Next thing you know, I would get good. And then I'd build confidence. And then I'd believe in myself. And then I would try more difficult things. And I would practice those things and get good and believe in myself. And it's these, these little wins that, that add up over time that build that confidence. Hey everyone, Jeff here, and as a thank you for listening to my show, I'd love to offer you a gift completely free. I have a full PDF with tactics and insights for how I built amazing relationships that have skyrocketed my personal success. If this sounds like something you're looking for, all you have to do is click the link in the show notes below. Now, on to the show. Yeah, and I mean, that is such a powerful yet different life lesson. Yeah. Most parents would not have done that to their five-year-old yeah. kid. But when you look back in the moment, it was probably like, oh my gosh. But now it, it might've been the best thing that your dad ever did for you. Yeah. hundred percent. And my dad's an optimist too. So like my dad was a big mentor in my life. You know, it's not, not mentor, like he had a lot of money or anything, but the, the, his mindset, the way he viewed life, like he, you know, is very positive, always thought anything was possible, like so excited to come to this country and, and live in this free land. You know, for him, it was like an exciting thing. And he was always pushing me to, to push the envelope and just go as far as I can. What did your dad do? Uh, he was an engineer. Hmm. So my dad was an engineer. My mom was a school teacher. And then uh, at one point he opened up uh, an engineering company. And then, you know, as a kid, my dream was always to take over dad's engineering mm -hmm. business. Uh, but we learned early on that I am not an engineer <laughs> because, you know, I'd go into the shop and after a couple of times I wasn't allowed to touch anything. Well, so. you said it, you don't sit down, you don't wait your turn, you don't listen to directions. I don't yeah. think those are the prerequisites for being a successful engineer. Yeah, exactly. I think you need to follow SOPs and stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. But you were a baseball player. Yeah, I loved baseball, man. Loved baseball. So did you have visions of playing baseball at the highest level? 100%. 100%. My, my whole life, I started working for, for baseball at eight years old, and I played baseball. That was another valuable lesson. I played baseball almost every single day. My dad would make me take pitching lessons every day, batting lessons every day. We would take ground balls, and he used to pay me. we go, okay, we're going to go hit ground balls this week, five days in a row. On Friday, you get a new video game. Deal. So he would actually pay me. So, he, so he, you were a pro. Yeah, yeah, I was a pro. I was, you know, 10, 10 11, 12 years old. But so, yeah, like I always believed baseball was my thing. And then I took one year off at 14. And I started playing ice hockey. I got into high school and I was so excited to start playing baseball. Um, 
actually pitched, uh, well, I think it was like one or two innings, like the first or second varsity game of my freshman year. That's impressive. And yeah, it was a very exciting experience. And then what happened was, I'll never forget this, life-changing. It's actually coming out in my book in February uh, called Flip Your Life. So I hadn't played baseball, you know, and I was, I was 15 years old at this point. I took a year off. So I go back and I start getting ready for the season. And I hit, I hit a, a batting practice at Home Run Park, the batting cages in, in uh, California. And then after I had a pitching lesson with a guy named Clyde Wright. And, and uh, I'll never forget this. And my arm started hurting. I was 15. And I decided to, to, to throw through the pain. And I ended up that night, and then I got frustrated with myself because of the pain, so then I threw harder. And that was the night I ruined my arm. Um, to this day, like I, I remember, I was crying in my dad's car. I was 15 crying because of the damage I did to my arm, and it was never the same. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, when you went to the doctor with the arm, did the doctor say you can never play again? They, they to this day, they still don't know what's wrong, but... It's it's nerve damage. So I would throw when I was done. Like my arm, would, my arm would literally, it would just go like this. <laughs> really? Yeah, it would just twitch and move, and it was it was just awful. And and I, and I ruined my baseball career. And then I was miserable the next couple of years after that because I still believed my arm would get better. So every year I suited up. Every year I was on the bench. Every year I ran laps. Every year I went to therapy. Every year I tried to pitch. And then finally, after years of just misery, misery. Um, I started throwing submarine underhand and I, and I learned how to throw underhand and it didn't cause pain in my arm. So I pitched, uh, my very last game was, uh, I think it was my, I think this was like the end of my junior year or early freshman year. And I threw a submarine and it was so bad that I walked off that field and I never went back. So how do you know I played baseball, by the way? Yeah, I know some things. Uh, we got some. We, we we do our homework for these shows. Oh yeah, I hit some baseballs too at the uh, the when, Arizona. When we stadium. were together. Yeah. Don't you remember when I was hitting them yeah. off the wall? Yeah, yeah. And they were like, "What?" I'm like, "Yeah, I used to play baseball too. Yeah. I played baseball till I was in my early 30s." Wow, how fun! Yeah, man. I had the dream. Yeah, I wasn't good enough, and I didn't injure my arm. Yeah, just wasn't good enough. Yeah, but that's well, okay, because it's not about the end result. I enjoyed the pursuit of it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Which is the lesson. Yeah. And I think as entrepreneurs, we struggle because we're always looking at a result. <clears throat> and what I loved about you telling that story is you continue to say, I still loved it. So I still suited up and I still ran the laps and I didn't just say, Oh, my arm's broken. So that's it. Yep. Still try. You got to try. You still got to try. Yep. Does your son play baseball? Um, no, not yet. We just started playing catch in the alley okay. from by our house. Yeah. Uh, but he's playing flag football. He's playing soccer uh, and he does jujitsu. And does your, does your daughter play? You play softball or? Yeah. So not softball. She, she, she's a stud though. She plays volleyball and oh. soccer and she's, she's really good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She tall? Uh, yeah. Yeah. She's about five foot seven and she's 13. Okay. Yeah. So sports. So, so yeah, both kids are athletes. Very competitive. Oh my gosh. Competitive. Did they get that from you? Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I could tell. <laughs> yeah. So you graduate high school, no baseball career, didn't go to college. Why real estate? Eng en from engineer and baseball to real estate is a pretty big pivot. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go real deep with you for a second. You know, Please. so in life, I kind of always got what I wanted. Um, I was a decent looking kid. I was athletic. I was witty. I was funny. I had a lot of friends. I was a leader, and I always felt pretty good. Um, and all of that ended when I graduated high school. So within six months of graduating high school, I fell into a terrible depression and became an alcoholic. I'd gained 50 pounds uh, in like a six, seven month period. I'd stretch marks on my sides. I wouldn't take my shirt off anymore. I was depressed. And at 18. At, at 18. Um, and I hit a really, really rough patch in my life to where I was at rock bottom thinking I, I, I'm the guy that used to be the man. Now I'm just fat, fat and sloppy sitting mm -hmm. on the couch drunk. So my life went real downhill. I lost all hope. Uh, I lost my confidence, and I thought my life was over. During that period, what were you doing day to day? Did you have a job? Drinking. No so I, job. I would drink a lot. Yeah, I mean, I was, I, I was, <laughs> I was going to college, but you know, classes at random times all over the place. And I was actually selling kitchen knives for Cutco. I'm sure you've heard mm -hmm. of Cutco. And it turns out I was pretty good at sales. So I'm like, my average sale was like four or 500 bucks and I was getting like 30, 40% commission. So I was, I was making decent money. And for, for those listening back then, that was a lot of money. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of money. But like, honestly, I mean, I would drink so much that I was waking up two, three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, wow. Um, and I would, I would go to bed at two, three in the morning. And it was just this vicious cycle. And I'll never forget after 
almost a year of drinking like that. Um, I had a night and I was like, you know, I, I got to take a night off. And I was living in Cerritos, California at the time. I walked outside and I could smell the grass. I can hear the, I can hear the animals. You could feel night. And it was my first time seeing night sober in a year. And, and I'll never forget that night. And that was the night I said, okay, maybe it's time to start making some changes. Um, but it, those changes didn't happen fast. I struggled with alcohol on and off for about 10 years. Um, but at that point, I, I got a little bit better. And here's what happened. So I was selling Cutco knives and I lost my sales book. <laughs> and every had every lead, every contact, every order. And I was like, man, I didn't know what to do. So I was at a Washington Mutual ATM staring at the machines down to like my last couple hundred bucks. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do for money? And then I have what, what I like to call a defining moment. You know, I, I like threw my head up. I'm like, man, what am I going to do? And I swear, true story, I look to the right and there's this crooked sign. <clears throat> and this crooked sign's hanging there. It says, wise old owl real estate school. <laughs> so I had a defining moment. You know, a, def a defining moment is, is a moment in your life that changes the trajectory. So I thought to myself, I said, well, if I can sell knives, I could probably sell houses. So then walked across the parking lot, signed up for my real estate classes. At and, Wise Old Owl Real Estate. Yep, at Wise Old Owl Real Estate. And at the time the girl I was dating, their family had been in real estate as investors, agents over like the last 40 years. So they, they were talking about it around mm -hmm. me. But that was like when it all clicked and I said, okay, I'm going to go sell real estate. So you walked over to Wise Old Owl Real Estate. That was it. And it was a get your license class? Yep, get your license class. And I had it was a Century 21 office. I had to sit and watch these VHS tapes of these ladies in the 80s with these big gold jackets, mm -hmm. you know, training about real estate. It was miserable. <laughs> But, How many you know, hours of that? 40, 50? What was that? How long is the course? 40 hours, 50 hours? I don't even remember, okay. but it felt like it took years. So then, right, I get my license. I'm young. I'm hungry. I'm motivated. I'm excited. I'm ready to take on the world. Um, totally struck out. Like, I, was, I wasn't making any money, no business. Um, and then I find out about this training event in Buena Park, California, where this real estate coach was coming into town to teach people how to make money in real estate. And... At the time, there were these ladies in my office that were talking crap about this guy and the fact that he charges people for coaching. And I'm listening to say, I can't believe people pay him coaching. It's a scam. And this whole time I'm thinking, what do you mean? There's coaches out there? I can get a coach? Like, where do I get this coach? Because I had sports coaches my whole life. And I, I know how important a coach is. But as, as a 20-year-old kid, as a, uh, as a licensed real estate agent, no one told me you can get a coach as an adult. Right. So as these ladies are talking smack, I'm listening. I end up going to that event. And if it wasn't for those ladies, and if it wasn't for that event, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So I go to this free event. It was at a Buena Park Sequoia Athletic Club. Throw, uh, and the guy was Mike Ferry. A couple hundred people in the room. And this guy, Mike, is a genius. Like, he convinced me. I, and by the way, I'd never heard a professional speaker. He convinced me I could do anything. He convinced me I could be unstoppable. He convinced me I'd be a top agent. He convinced me I'd be a millionaire. Like any possible thing I wanted in life, he convinced me I could do it. So at the end of the event, I, I wrote, I ripped a piece of paper. I wrote, my name is Tarek El Musa. You don't know me today, but one day you will. And I handed it to him. And by the way, he knows, he knows me today. <laughs> so, and, and that was a defining moment. But here's what happened. I signed up for one-on-one -on -one coaching. Okay? With him? Uh, not with him, but with his company. Okay. It was $1,000 a month back in 2003, which is like a million dollars a month today with inflation, mm -hmm. right? Right, at so, least. So now imagine this. It's $1,000 a month. I'm 20 years old. Did you have $1,000? No, God, okay. no. Okay. God, no. 20 years old, totally broke. I had broken up my girlfriend. I tried to move back home. My parents got divorced. My mom rented out my bedroom, so I was sleeping in the garage with like cockroaches and spiders and my dirt bike. Like a garage. You hit the clicker, the thing <laughs> opened. You know, it wasn't converted. I burned the boats, man. I was like, I have a credit card. <laughs> so I was like, I made a deal with myself. I said, all right, I'm going to sign up. I'm going to sign up for this coaching going all in. And if it works, great. You made it. If it doesn't work, I have to go back to school. And I did not want to go back to school. And that entire time I was in real estate, I never had a coach. So I never really knew what to do. So I would try an open house. I would, I would wait for somebody to call. I'd, I'd go knock on a couple doors, zero results. <clears throat> So I got this coach and I went after something called expired listings. You know what expired listing is? Tell me. Okay. Let's just say you list your house with a real estate agent. Uh, you do a six month contract. After six months, if the agent doesn't sell your house, it's an expired contract. Okay. Which means legally other real estate agents can go to you to try to solicit to get your listing. And there's a database with these 
Yep. Every day, updated with all the new ones all around mm-hmm. the country. Hint, hint. <laughs> mm-hmm. So what I did is this. I got this script, okay? I, I pinned it on my cubicle, and my coach said, you have to make 20, com- 20 contacts a day, which is 20 conversations a day. I told him I'm going to do 50. He said, yeah, right. So my only rule was to have 50 conversations a day. It wasn't to get listings. It wasn't to make money. It was to get 50 conversations a day. So that's what I did. Like butchered it. Hi, my name is Tarek El Moussa. Like reading the script, <laughs> like bro, like bad, right? But that's how you learn. Yep. Within 90 days of doing this, I went from being a 20-year-old kid with no money living in my mom's garage with spiders to 90 days later, I was in escrow to buy almost a million dollar house. And I had, I had ended up making 120,000 in commissions in a 90 day period. Because you made 50 conversations a day. Because of 50 conversations a day. And then, so here's here's the problem. Most people, they can't stomach it because they'll call someone, hi, my name is so-and-so real estate. When do you plan on interviewing a new agent? Go F yourself, click, they yep. hang up. Most people are like, oh, this isn't gonna work. How am I gonna convince this mm-hmm. person? You are never going to convince that person. That's the secret. All the people yelling at you, you're not going to get them. You need to get yelled at enough until you find someone that doesn't (laughs) yell at you. And when you find the person that doesn't yell at you, that's where you do business. That's where you make your money. And and that was the magic. So if I was on 49 contacts for the day, it's 8.15 at night, and I'm exhausted, right? And I call someone. They say, Tarek, go go F yourself. Am I mad? God, no. I'm celebrating because I just hit my 50th contact. And I can go home. Mm -hmm. So that very simple lesson of conversations per day is the foundation of my entire life. You know, it's funny. I have the same story in my own way. Yeah. I had my one job out of law school was ADP. I got there and they said, selling payroll. And they said, you got to make 50 phone calls a week. We'll get you five appointments. You get five appointments, you close two deals. And I said, okay, I'm going to do 100 phone calls a day or a week. And I'm going to get 10 appointments. I'm going to close four. In my first six months, I was the number one sales rep in the country. I bought a house, that, made that, President's that's Club, that's and what, no one else makes those calls. Like I, like, I don't understand to this day what people are waiting for. Like, I, I legitimately made five to 600 phone calls a day for a decade. Yep. People have no idea. I, I started this when I was 20 years old. I yep. didn't become known until I was 30 years old. 10 years grinding away 12 to 18 hours a day. And anyone can do what you did. Anybody. Yeah. And some people probably are be- would be better yep. earlier, and some would be worse. Yeah. Because, like you said... You might be better than some, but someone's going to be a better cold caller yeah. and conversationalist on the phone. And that person could probably do it in 45 calls or contacts. Yep. And someone else might take 60. Yep. But if you're sitting there making 18 calls today and six tomorrow and none on Wednesday and- Never going to happen. Wishing and wondering, why can't I? That's the formula right there. Yeah, that's it. And, and like for me, I just, I refuse to quit. Like- if, if, I, if, I, if I put my mind to something and I say I'm going to do something, I will do whatever it takes mm-hmm. to get it done. If I say I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to lose weight. If I'm going to build muscle, I'm going to build muscle. If I'm going to start a business, I'm going to – like whatever it is I do. And it's awful. It's painful. There's highs. There's lows. It's emotional. It's difficult. It's stressful. But as long as you never quit, you never fail, and eventually you're going to win. <clears throat> that's right. And that's the difference is the quit. Yep. People look at failure as this moment where – the result I was after today didn't happen, but that's not failure. That's the process. Yeah, It's like climbing a mountain and sometimes you have to, it's not straight up. There's sometimes there's switchbacks. You got to walk down a couple yeah. and you're like, why am I walking downhill to go uphill? Because yeah. the mountain trails, that's the path. Yeah. Yeah. It's when you actually quit. It's yeah. failure. That's it. When you quit. And then like, and then, then the truth is the hardest part is just getting started. If, if people would just understand if you just start, it mm-hmm. happens because you build routines. It becomes familiar. And over time, you learn. Like, if you look at people, 90% of people that want to do something, they never actually start because, and, and that's the most difficult, the most difficult spot. Yep. Like, I have students in my homeschooled community where I teach people how to flip houses. They're getting on calls. They're reading books. They're watching webinars, but, but they're never actually starting. You, at some point, you got to mm-hmm. knock on a door. At some point, you got to make a phone call. At some point, you got to eat better food. At some point, you got to wake up earlier. At some point, you got to go for a walk. At some point, you got to go to the gym. Yeah, you got to you got to do. We were talking about it earlier. I'm a doer. I don't talk about things. I don't think about things. I do things. It's amazing the results that happen when you do things. That's it. A hundred percent of the stuff gets done if you actually do the stuff. You just got to do it. And zero percent gets done if you think about doing exactly. the stuff. And I love that that process taught you that early because sales, whether you like sales or not, everyone's in sales. Yep. 
even if you're an accountant, you're in sales. If you're a doctor, you're in sales because you're either selling your idea to your company, you're selling why you should get the promotion or the raise, you're selling people to come work for you. So you need to hone that sales skill. And I think everybody should take a part of their journey and work on that element. Cold calling is the greatest. Yeah, yeah. It, it is the greatest. But I also think people are very, very confused on what sales is. I'll give you an example. So I had a live event a couple of weeks ago, and I had one of my students in the room. She's very shy. She's kind of quiet. And she and she grabbed the microphone. And she's shivering up there. She goes, you know, but I'm I'm not a I'm not a salesperson like you. I don't have that personality. I can't do what you do. And I stopped her. You know what I told her? I said, 42 year old Tark would take you in his living room to talk about real estate over 20 year old Tark seven days a week. Mm-hmm. You want to know why? Because sales is about mimicking your prospect. So if you have someone that's quieter and shyer, do they want this killer salesperson in there? No, they want to be mirrored. So what most people don't understand, a salesperson isn't like, you don't have to be this like A-type personality. A salesperson is just mimicking your process or your your prospect, right? Being like, Mm -hmm. right? Mimic them. Mm -hmm. And sales is nothing more than asking a series of questions to help people get what they want. Yep. Like I talk about real estate, like, oh, how do you close these deals? Um, If you sold this home, where would you go next? Oh, that's exciting. Why would you move there? Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Well, what's your time frame on getting there? Oh, really? So when do you plan to start working on things so you can get there? It's just questions. That's, that's all sales selling. is. Like cars. Um, what kind of a car are you looking for? <laughs> if, if you can have the perfect color car, what would it be? Like, you know what I mean? It's just asking questions. Hey, fitness fans, ready to crush your fitness goals? Make your move to EOS Fitness, where becoming a member starts at just $9.99 a month. Gyms are open 24-7 and packed with the latest gym equipment to keep your workouts fresh. What are you waiting for? Give them a call, drop by, or hit up jefffenster.com forward slash EOS to join. EOS Fitness, better gym, better price. Now, let's get after those goals. As an entrepreneur, I know how meaningful it is to invest in the people and causes that are close to me. And on GoFundMe, it's easy, safe, and powerful to do just that. Whether you're supporting a family member, friend, local business, or charity. And whenever you make a donation, you're protected by the GoFundMe giving guarantee. Visit GoFundMe.com today to help make a positive difference in your community. You know, it's funny. So I have a, because I've been in sales my whole life, I have this tendency when we, me and my wife will travel and she makes fun of me because I will speak at the same cadence as wherever we go. So if we're in an island in the Caribbean and my waiter or waitress has got their cadence, it's a different, and she's like, you always kind of mirror them. And it's just innate because from sales, that's right. That's how you create that familiarity. And then you begin the solution-based process of asking questions, identifying a need, and seeing if you have a solution to solve a need. Yeah. And if you don't, that's okay. Because that's how you also build trust. Yeah, yeah. I can't help you do that. But what I can do is introduce you to someone who can. And then you start to build relationships. Exactly. And then what, what most people do that are in sales, they're scared to ask questions. Mm-hmm. And then without questions, you can't get answers. And without answers, you don't know if they're serious. And then you're just spinning your wheels, wasting your time. But that's also how learning is done. Even if you're not a sales person, you're not selling a product or service, It's also just how you become inquisitive and learn. Yeah. If I had the opportunity to meet you at a live event and I was interested in real estate, but I wasn't yet in real estate, I'd want to ask you all these questions. I'd want to learn this story because learning this story makes me go, oh, wait, Tarek wasn't born this way. Yeah. He wasn't selling real estate at 14. That's what people don't get. Like we, we all start at zero, you know, it's like, you know, people are like, it's like, if I just, I wish they understood the journey I've Mm -hmm. been on. Like, damn, like. Grinded it out for 10 years, filmed on, I pitched a TV show about flipping houses before I ever flipped a house, cart before the horse. And then I filmed through two cancers, gaining 60 pounds. And and then I had a back uh, incident and then back surgery. I lost 60 pounds and then a public divorce. And like my life has been filled with like so much pain, you know, that I I use that as fuel because now like I've rebuilt my life and I'm happy, I'm positive, I'm I'm centered. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I wouldn't change that because I'm I'm so grateful to yeah. wake up every day. I'm so grateful for my my wife. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for my family, my life, everything I have. Where prior to 
this crazy experience I've been through in the last decade, I wasn't as grateful as I am today. Have you seen that, that, I don't know if it's a meme or a video, but it's two marbles and one is going straight down and one goes up and down. Mm -mm. So they drop two marbles and that, this is just physics. The marble that has to go up and down, up and down beats the one that just goes straight down. No way. Yeah. And the moral of that, in, well, the, there's a science reason, I don't know, but the moral that I <laughs> took from that was without ups and downs, you actually get further faster. Yeah. Right. And to the point that you said, like that decade, and I want to touch on a few of those because that was kind of where I was going to go next of ups and downs led you to have that expedited path to where you are today, where everyone does get to see you, you know, two, soon to be three TV shows, a new book coming out, obviously a, a new, a new family with a new baby. Um, but I want to talk about the cancers. Yeah. Because those, those are moments in time that can obviously derail everybody. I mean, our health is, is our greatest wealth. Yeah. And you had not one, but two instances. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So Here's the interesting thing. To, to this day, the doctors don't know why I got cancer. They don't know why I had two different cancers. Um, so I, I have some thoughts on it. So I believe that my cancer came from the abuse I put on uh, on my, my, my mind and body. Um, those 10 years when I was making those calls and doing all these things, it, I wasn't positive. I wasn't excited. I was overwhelmed. I was stressed out of my mind. I was, you know, always chasing money. Always like, and then drinking at night, smoking two packs of cigarettes. So I think my body just said, screw you and broke down. And, and I think it was a, a sign that if I don't change, I'm going to die because mm -hmm. I, I, obviously I could have died. I had two different cancers. So I found out I had cancer, um, in 2013, there was a nurse out of Texas who was watching my show who noticed a lump on my neck, sent an email to the production company said, Hey, this is serious. He should get it checked out. Just by watching you on TV. Just just by watching me on TV. And then for the for two years before that, I was always like clearing my throat. And I felt pressure in my neck. So I, I went to my general doctor a couple of times and they gave me like allergy medicine, medicine and no spray, no further testing, nothing. So when I received that email, I knew something was off. So I went to a different doctor. I did a biopsy. You, you actually saw the email? Yeah, yeah. Because you were probably getting hundreds, if not yeah. thousands of random emails? Yeah. Well, it didn't come to me. It went to the production company and the network. And, and they took it seriously. And then they sent it to me. Yeah. Yeah. And right when I, right when I saw that email, I knew something was off. Um, so I went to a different doctor. I had a biopsy done, came back as atypical, meaning it, it might or might not be cancer. So then I went in for exploratory sur surgery. It was supposed to be like an hour. Ended up being about five hours. When I woke up, I had my, my ex-wife, Christina, looking down at me, just crying. And the, I mean, the first things I said is, I have cancer, don't I? And the answer was yes. Turns out I had um, stage three thyroid cancer, uh, I'd taken over my entire th uh, thyroid and had spread to my lymph nodes. So like I had a, a like real stage three cancer. So going into it, didn't even know I had cancer. I woke up, everything's removed, everything's gone, stage three. So because of that misdiagnosis, we went through uh, old medical records and I had an irregular testicle exam a year before. Irregular? So, testicle okay. exam, mm -hmm. you know. And just as a precaution on my own, I was like, okay, I, sh I should probably go look into this. So the wild part is I'm at my thyroid cancer doctor, uh, Kaiser and Irvine. And while I'm there last minute, they're like, hey, we got an opening for an ultrasound for my, my junk, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, I had yeah. to go get it checked. So I'm talking to the ex. So then I walk down the hall. I'm talking to the uh, x-ray technician. He was a, a guy from Huntington Beach. You know, it's an interesting situation. So you're just chatty talking. And this guy was chatty. And then all of a sudden he got quiet. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty bad ADHD. Um, and one of my gifts is reading people it really is. And it's one of my superpowers. And I can feel his energy shifting. And, and I asked him, I said, Hey, what's going on? He goes, Oh, nothing. I was like, no, no, not nothing. What's going on? He's like, you're, I'm like, you're being all quiet. What's up? He's like, I'm not a doctor. I'm like, I know you're not a doctor. Like what's going on. And, and then he goes, are you in pain? And then I'm like thinking, what do you mean? What am I in pain? I was like, what do you, what do you mean? And then he goes, if you're in pain, the emergency room's down the hall. Um, when he said that, I knew I was in trouble. So I go down the hall, go to the emergency room. 15 minutes later, I have a surgeon coming in telling me I have testicular cancer and they need to schedule a surgery. And that's different. It's not the same cancer that spread from the thyroid. Exactly. Two completely different cancers. So now I'm, I think I was 31 fighting two cancers at the same time. In my mind, I'm dead. I yeah. know nothing about cancer. I don't know how severe cancer is. I don't know how to fix cancer. All I know is I have two of them and I'm dead. Um, and man, that was a terrifying experience. I can't imagine. So, you know, 
terrifying experience. I got a call from the network. It was right at the beginning of season two. They're like, hey, we understand. Don't worry about the show. Blah, blah. I said, bullshit. You guys are going to film me every second of the way. You guys are going to film me on a stretcher rolling into that surgery. Mm -hmm. And I did it. So uh, if you watch season two of my show, because of all the stuff I went through, I actually gained 60 pounds on national TV. And you gained weight. 60 pounds. Yeah. I thought most, and this goes to some of my ignorance, I thought cancer, most people lose weight. Yeah. Different things. So for me, they, they removed my entire thyroid and then I had to go uh, do radioactive iodine. So before you do that, you can't take any T3 or T4 medications. So my diet was white rice, chicken, and avocado, and every day I'd wake up heavier. It was the wildest experience. I just blew up. Um, but I never quit. You know, I filmed through those two cancers, um, and I think it was five days after my surgeries, I was back on camera. And it, it, was, it was pretty rough on me. The worst part about all of this was um, having all of my hormones off. What people don't realize is your hormones regulate everything, your mind, your body, your spirit, right? So yeah. all my levels were off. I was dealing with anxiety, panic attacks, depression. I had highs, I had lows, I was manic. I was happy, I was sad, like all these emotions and feeling. And I was living in turmoil for years. And you know, ultimately that turmoil uh, led, led, to my, led to my divorce. Yeah. Um, and you know, looking back, you know, I, I wasn't the best guy. Um, I wasn't the best husband. Definitely not. Wasn't the best father. Wasn't the best son. Wasn't the best friend. I was just wasn't the best human. Uh, no excuses. I was going through a lot at the time, but my actions were not the best. Right. So when when my when my my ex left me, man, I went to I went to some soul searching places. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming out in the book. I actually I actually lived in a halfway house. So That's my first time sharing that. Wow. Yeah, I've never shared that before. Um, what made you choose a halfway house? I didn't trust myself to be alone. That's how bad I was. Yeah. So the reason I ended up there is because I didn't know where to go and I needed 24-hour care. It was, it, was, it was pretty bad because, you know, I, was, uh, I, I, I had lost everything, felt like overnight, and there were so many different things going on. The worst part about it, which was like nail in the coffin, was about a year before the, the, the separation, I was tired all the time, like a dark cloud over me because no energy because your T3 and T4 mm -hmm. uh, hormones. So I ended up going uh, to a Botox doctor who put me on testosterone injections, fat burner injections, HCG injections, and some other injections. What's, what's HCG? Um, HCG is, man, HCG, it, it, it produces, I believe it produces estrogen. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a, I believe it's more geared towards, uh, towards women, but I was taking so much testosterone. My, anyways, this shit made me crazy. I had full on roid rage. Um, it took me to the highest highs I've ever been to in my life. The lowest lows I ever went to in my life. I was impatient, short tempered. It, it ruined me. Um, so you take the testosterone with the thyroid medications and the hormones, yeah. and my life was a disaster. And looking back, when you're when you're going through that hell, like you don't even realize you're going through it. And I know there's so many people out there right now just going through some of the worst shit in their entire life. And if they just start working on themselves and working on the future and working on getting better. Like they, they can build their life again. They can get their life back. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I lost my way and I worked so hard to get it back. Do you remember the moment? Because when you're spiraling down and you're in that storm and it feels like everything's going astray and dealing with cancers and divorce and your weight gain and the hormones and probably the network probably wasn't happy with your performance at that time. Yeah. And, and people on people on social media were calling me fat, yes. blah, blah, blah. You name it. What was that moment where you were able to look up and say, okay, I have a path to get up. I have a path to get out of this hellhole. Was there a moment or was it just kind of? There was. There was. As a, as a, see, you know, it's like, it's, it's crazy how life hits you, you know. So we separated in uh, May of 2016. I think it was about 10 months later. It took me years to get over my divorce. Um, it was about 10 months later. And I mean, I'm talking rock bottom, dude. Like, I did not want to be alive. I felt that bad. Um, I was driving up and down Newport Boulevard in Newport Beach where I live. 
And I, did, I, I wouldn't turn onto my street up and down for like an hour, just crying, screaming, yelling, complaining, bitching, pissing, moaning. And I'll never forget. I'm finally at the light to turn to my street and I'm yelling about the fact that this isn't fair. How this isn't fair. I, I, I like, I, I need a chance. I need an opportunity. Like, how did this happen to me? And then the word fair hit me. Mm -hmm. And then I had a, a moment with myself and I decided, um, to accept the fact that life wasn't fair. And the second I said it out loud, this isn't fair, that's not fair. And then I said, well, life's not fair. The second I said, life's not fair, that was the beginning of me rebuilding my life. Mm -hmm. So when life's not fair, what does that mean? That means it is what it is and you do the best with what you got. Yep. And some people start at zero, some people start at two, some people start at 20. So if you're at zero, don't, don't bitch about the people starting at 20, except that you're at zero and figure out how to get to 20. So that was, that was a defining moment for me, the word fair. <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm glad you came to that realization yeah. at that moment. Yeah, in that moment, man, just sitting there. Yeah, because yeah. life isn't fair. That's what I tell my children all the time. Any of my kids ever say, that's not fair. I go, life's not fair. All the time. You got to stop waiting for fair. You wait forever. We can't decide where we're born, who our parents are, what resources we do or don't have, what we look like what opportunities come knocking. You just have yeah, to be ready. It, it, yeah, and, that, and that's the problem. Everybody is is waiting, oh, I'm going to meet this person. Mm -hmm. I, that I'm going to get, I was, one day I'm, someone's going to give me an opportunity. Nobody <laughs> is ever going to give you anything. Yep. If you show up and you show you want it, then there's a chance they're going to help you get it, but they will never give you anything. Most people think, oh, I just need an opportunity. No, no. You will never get an opportunity. You have to make opportunities. And you have to be prepared when that opportunity comes. Yeah. Because so often people don't think they have opportunities, but the problem is they weren't prepared to recognize it when it was right there. Yeah. You, you know what's crazy? You know what's interesting? I've been thinking about this a lot lately. So like my life's been interesting. You know, like my parents were immigrants. I grew up in a city called Buena Park by Knott's Berry Farm. Uh, you know, I, it was kind of a rougher area. I, I hung out with some pretty rough people in my, young, my younger days, like, like real, real rough people. And here, and here's what I've learned. So I've, I've hung out with like the worst criminals you could imagine to today hanging out with some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world. And here's what I've learned. Those people down here, some of them, they have more game, mm -hmm. more skills, more energy, more tenacity than the people over here. The only difference is they don't believe they can do what these people do. Yeah. So it's just that mindset. It's just the mindset mm -hmm. of trying. And then a lot of people, they don't think they can do it. And then they'll kind of try and then they'll fail immediately and then they'll quit. Well, well, one, you didn't try, right? Like people don't understand. Well, however hard someone thinks it's going to be, it's going to be 10 times harder. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. I guarantee for you to get to where you are today, how much harder was it than you thought? Much. To get to here was exponentially more difficult than I ever thought. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm here, I wouldn't change a thing and it was worth it. Because even though it's much harder than we would have ever imagined, we weren't prepared for the level of hardness back when we started. But you don't have to be yeah. because you're not there yet. Yeah. The top of the mountain is the hardest part to get right before the peak. But you're not there. You're at the bottom of the mountain Yeah. where the path is laid out and it's much simpler. You just have to start. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's that journey. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's the starting. Like I say it all the time. It's like, I, I'll never forget the first time I rode my bike, no handlebars. I think I was, I was four years old, uh, living, uh, living or no, uh, no, uh, what are those things called on the, the training wheels? wheels? Training wheels. I was four no years handlebars. old. That would have been interesting. Yeah, that would have been interesting. I'm driving down the show. I'll never forget. I drive in, I go down, I crash. I'm scraped up, bleeding everywhere. And I'm screaming. <laughs> I'm so happy. Today I'm on my bike. I'm on my phone. I'm listening to music. No hands. Well, well why is that? Practice. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're going to get good at things without practice. You, you can't get good without practice. You know what I find fascinating about that is we forget that every child, little babies, teach, can teach us everything we need to know on how to succeed. Because little babies learn to walk and they fall a thousand times. They hit their head. They fall down after two steps. And we think it's cute. Yep. If babies had the same lack of, or if babies followed what adults do with that lack of tenacity and stick to and willing to try, no, none of us would ever walk, ever. Yeah. Because as adults, we try something and the first or second time we fall, we quit because it's not for us. Yeah. I'm not good enough. But 
you are. You just have, very few of us can just do something once and be great. But that's what, imagine a baby falls down a couple of times. Well, this is too hard. I'm just never going to walk. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 like, but, that, but that's, that's what it is. Like, th- here's what I tell people all the time. I always go back to high school. So when, like, I have like a sales rep that's not performing or not doing well. I go back to high school. If you treated your business or you treated being an entrepreneur like high school, you would be successful. Here's why in high school, because I used to do this crap. I would sometimes stay up to one, two in the morning crashing, studying for an exam the next day, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I, I think about how much work we put in high school. If we all kept that same energy and same uh, tenacity into our adult lives, everybody would be so much further. But what mm-hmm. happens is most people get confused. They work so hard in high school, right? And then they go to college. And then they work so hard in college to get that degree. And finally, they, they have the degree. Now it's time to, to do the work. Most people are tricked into believing the work is done before. Yep. And the work's done when you get the degree. No, no, that's bullshit. This is the ticket to start. This is the ticket to start working. So if people would mm-hmm. treat their careers, their lives, their businesses, the way they treated college, their SATs, high school, they would be so much further. So true. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. You have a fascinating journey. I'm excited for your book. Yeah, it's 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 a it's it's a it's a fu- it's a fun one. So a lot of wild stories in there, you yeah. know. Um, comes out in February. Yeah, it comes out February sixth. You know, um, you know, I mentioned that I went through a hard period from eighteen to twenty. You know, one of the reasons that really ca- caused that period was um, I got off of ADHD medication called Dexedrine because at eighteen they wanted me to go to the doctors. Then I ended up getting on ADD medicines at 16 after I, after I went to juvenile hall. Um, so all of that is in the book and it's a, it's a pretty interesting story. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Gonna, I'm, I'm excited to read it. You're gonna have to send me a, I want a signed copy. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of for course. my collection. Of course. But you know, through all this hell and misery and turmoil and all this nonsense I've, I've been through all these years today, I'm happier than I've ever been. I'm, I'm more excited about life than I've ever been. Mm-hmm. I'm more grateful than I've, I've ever been. And, and I'm finally at a point in my life, I'm 42. I am so excited to share everything I've learned with the world. I am so passionate about teaching and educating and helping other people get ahead and, and just live that life they've always dreamed of. And I like the clean shave. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a couple. I mean, of years. I don't think I've ever a couple. The last time I saw you, you definitely didn't have a clean shave. No. It's been three years since I three since years. I shaved. So yeah. Wow. This one's for you today. I appreciate it. It's looking good. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at my I was looking in the mirror yesterday. I saw a lot of gray. I said, okay, maybe we cut this thing. <laughs> no salt and pepper? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. So the TV shows, before we round this out, yeah, because you have a new show coming out. Yeah. Two new shows. Uh one one new show. Oh uh, no, the new the new show, uh the new show uh, is out already. So season one of the flipping El Moose. Yeah, but it's a new show. The flipping El Moose is a new yeah, yeah, that's that's a new series. Yep. So Flipping El Musa, season one, uh, premiered in 2023. Right now, we're filming 14 episodes, premiering uh, in spring, early summer of 2024, and it's a really fun show. That's fun. Yeah. So what's the, for those who haven't seen season one, go check it out, but what is the, what's the main premise? Uh, it's it's uh, my wife, Heather, and I flipping houses in Southern California. and As a family. A, as a family. So the kids are involved, the, the parents are involved, but what we're doing is is different, and it's it's actually working, which is really, really neat. So what we're trying to do is to create luxury high-end looking homes for for the everyday house. So give a $10 million home look for a million dollar house. And we're we're actually pulling it off by really spending time on sourcing materials and and using the right designers and finding materials at a low cost that look super high end. And instead of getting marble slabs, get porcelain slabs that look like marble. So like all these little tricks we're learning and these houses, they're just, they're coming out beautiful. Well, I remember when you texted me for the, the premiere and I watched it, that first one came out fantastic. And I remember saying, wow, that, that does look better than the neighborhood oh, these, by a lot. These houses, hands down, 10 times better than last year. Like, yes. I wanted I wanted people to learn through our show. I wanted people to get inspired through our show. I wanted people to want our homes through our show. I wanted people to want their homes to look like our homes, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think I think we pulled it off because, like, I'm impressed by the houses. Where, <laughs> like, I look at them, I'm like, damn. That looks so good for a 1300 square foot house. Nobody's going to find a house like this. That's awesome. And what was the inspiration for that show? Uh, You know, it was my passion for real estate investing. And I'm always trying to push the envelope, take things to the next level. And I really wanted to to create better houses. 
and yeah. and I'm re- we're really doing it. Well, yeah, I mean, between you and your wife, I mean, you guys are a real estate power couple. Yeah. Obviously, both of you have had your own successes and your own shows, and to put you together, yeah. Watch out, world, because yeah. you're going to change the real estate game in Southern California. Yeah, yeah. So we're having a lot of fun there, uh, and then we're working on a, a surprise project right now. Should come out in 2024. Can't share too yeah. much about that yet. Um, and then also we're exploring doing a podcast together, you know, different things together. We enjoy being together. Yeah. And a new baby together. Yeah. And a new which baby. Which is awesome. It's, it's been great though. I know we've been talking about business a lot, but you know, man, like my, my, my wife saved, saved my life. You know, I was so, so sad and, until that day I met her um, four and a half years ago. And it was mm-hmm. kind of like a big turning point for me. Yeah. And um, the last four, four and a half years of my life have, have just been incredible. Well, it's, it's, an, it's truly amazing to see where you are now and how far you've come because not, and I don't mean that from the bottom to your successes. I mean, from yeah. the roller coaster of your life, because you've had a few setbacks that are the foundation, which a lot of us stay and uses the excuse to why yeah. I'm not here because I'm a can't, you know, I had to deal with cancer or I had, a, I lost my family and had a divorce or I gained all this weight or my hormones were a wreck. Or all of these, other, or the I've media hates me, or I've gone broke, right? And unfortunately, we all have to deal with our own ups and downs. And you're publicly being the example for all of us to say, you know what? Look at your own life, but I'm sharing mine. The vulnerability that you show, I mean, the fact that you allowed the cameras to follow you through cancer. Yep. You had a public divorce. Yep. There's very few things about your life that's probably not public at this yeah, point. Yeah, and after the book, it's all out. Like today, I, sh- I shared some things that I've never shared in my entire life. So this is uh, the first time anyone's hearing it. Well, I appreciate you being vulnerable with us because, and being willing and having the courage to be willing to expose the real experience of Tarek because a lot of us are embarrassed yeah. or uncomfortable and saying, well, I'm going to keep that private. And so my last question for you is, how do you feel about your life being 100% public? Is there times you almost want to keep some things private? Uh, you know, not really, man. You know, here, here's, the, here's the biggest lesson I've learned about life with, with people. And I, and I say this uh, often. As humans, as people, we're, we're literally no different than a house. Meaning it doesn't matter how old the house is or, or beat up the house is or how cockroach infested or mold infested, right? Because people just like a house, they can go through a remodel. Mm -hmm. And and that's what flipping your life is all about. It's literally remodeling who you are, what you are, and what you want to be. And you start from the inside out. And and that's exactly what I did. So for me, if if I can inspire people to make massive change in their life and take action to improve their lives, then it was worth it. Because looking at me from, you know, a shithead kid 20-something years ago, juvenile hall, always in trouble— to today helping and inspiring and leading, that that shows that anything really is possible. And if I'm able to touch people and help people and get them to change their mindset and pour, m- put more positive energy into the world, it just makes it a better place. Well, you're an inspiration to me. I've always enjoyed our, our, our conversations and I get to watch you publicly, but I love real estate. I love what you guys are doing. It's been such an honor to have you here and sharing this story. And I'm excited for your book. I think it's a must read for everybody, regardless if you're in real estate or not, because the truth is, like you just said, we all can remodel our lives and who we are, and we should. Yeah. Because even if things are good and nothing breaks, time weathers and the game continues to evolve and change, and we need to continue to update ourselves to the present to be the best version of ourselves. And you've been a living example publicly yeah. on how to be the absolute best version of yourself. And I think today, right now, you are you are living your your best life at the moment, and it's it's an honor and privilege to see. So I want to thank you for coming on and sharing all this with our, with yeah, our audience, fun, man. Buddy. This was super fun. I had a great time. And, yeah. was, and it's crazy to think, you know, I woke up at 4.30 a.m. to be here today on a podcast where many years of my life, I would still be drinking at 4.30 a.m. Crazy. Crazy. Remodel your life. This February, get your copy of Flip Your Life and make sure you check out the brand new show with Tarek, the, the surprise show, and season two of the new show. That's it. Thank you guys for checking this out. Hey everyone, first I want to thank all of you for tuning in. And if you guys haven't heard about my new book, Relationship Bank Account, click the link in the show notes or search the title on Amazon. This book is packed with all my secrets to success in both relationships and life. Make sure to pick up a copy and if the book helps you on your journey, let us know by leaving a review.
I appreciate all of you and can't wait to see you on the next one.